right. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Teo Laine, and I'm going to give a certain duration long presentation about reactor space. Uh, earlier, I gave the name uh, Embedded Platform Development, but after writing quite a many slides, I came to the conclusion that the embedded part was just a small part of it, so now there's something for everyone. And I'd actually like to make a quick poll, so please raise your hand if you have done some embedded development. Okay, thanks. <coughs> Around half. Um, and please raise your hand if you have heard of reactor space or our satellite project before submitting to the <laughs> uh, meetup. Okay, thanks. So everyone knows something about it. Uh, please, uh, if you get any questions, you can ask while I do the presentation. There's quite a lot of stuff and I have no idea how long it takes. So I'll try to just move on and uh, let's see how long it takes. We have two hours. <coughs> so, uh, recap of the contents. So, just some background of, of, of the project. Uh, about the company, why we do this, what we are actually doing. Uh, kind of an example mission, like uh, you need to have some kind of goal to start working on it and then you keep that as like the MVP for your thing. Uh, then uh, some remarks about uh, in general the software development in this environment. Uh, then about the architecture of the whole thing. It's more about the communications architecture because communication is quite a big part of it and maybe not that much details on the architecture of the satellite but we can go through some of that also. And then I just picked a couple of like a maybe interesting problems that we've had to tackle. They are not in any way, well some of them might be a bit unique to this domain but some of them are not. But it's something that I haven't had to do before at reactor, uh, at least that much. Or then it's in some other form in this project maybe. So background, so what do we want to do? So build a satellite and the needed ground infrastructure. Sounds interesting. So why would we want to do this as a reactor? So nano satellites, these around this size or smaller satellites is kind of a new thing and there are maybe some interesting business opportunities there that no one has really or not many people have re really materialized yet and reactor hasn't done anything in space sector yet so if we start with something like this maybe we can build up something that convinces people us to get some work uh, in this industry or maybe we can make some new business out of it and uh, <coughs> Why it's interesting also is that it's uh, something that's um, getting cheaper and cheaper. So everything is based on commercial off-the-shelf hardware. There are more and more launch opportunities. So to take stuff to space, you don't need special hardware anymore to do this or produce it by yourself. And uh, as I said, there are not that many uh, big competitors yet. And one big challenge is that the old industry, let's say some agri agricultural or uh, other industries that or city planning or whatever might benefit from uh, f from this kind of service, they they are not maybe yet into these nanosatellites which provide new kind of way of getting information. It might be challenging to convince them because their competition is not doing it yet. And why would we want to do all this by ourselves is to learn about it. And of course space is pretty nice so this event for example is a bit of PR and everyone likes it and of course we would like to do more of it in the future. So how did this came to be? Uh, someone, I, th I guess the story goes that during the training trip someone got a, got a good idea that why don't we go to space and then half a year later uh, 2015, in the fall, we started kind of brainstorming with interested people. Uh, what could that actually be? 
and we came to the conclusion that we could make a sat this kind of small satellite and related stuff. And early 2016, two people started working full time on this. Uh, me was the other guy, and uh, Juho Salmio is the other guy. We are both coder background. And uh, then there's been a lot of help from marketing and sales, and of course, anyone at Reactor who has had interest and free time has also come by and contributed, for example, if they have been between projects. And uh, since we have only a software background, basically, uh, who's doing the hardware then? The guys who worked in Otaniemi with the Alta 1 and 2 satellites, they wanted to make a startup after finishing their projects and continue working on space and, and getting paid for it. And Reactor was supposed to be their first customer, but the synergies were so good that now they are part of Reactor. And there's around five people there, so they have hardware background, we have a lot of software and design and engineering background, but no space hardware background, so it's a good match. And together we are building this Reactor Hello World satellite. And I mentioned uh, uh, nanosatellites, so what we are working on is this CubeSat standard, which basically defines that these satellites are made of units of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters around, uh, and they are usually uh, multiples of one, two, three, or six units. So a small cube or a big serial carton. And the benefit of this form factor is that if you have excess space in a rocket for taking like a mini bus sized big satellite there, you can fill the rest with these standard sized uh, satellites that all fit into standard launch tubes. So you don't need to design the launching or the deployment for everything. And here you can see uh, this three unit CubeSat and uh, specific launch port, so you can see that there's a, just a spring, you load the satellite there, close the hatch in space, open hatch, spring pushes it out, and you're in there. Easy. And here's uh, our satellite, a Reactor Hello World engineering model. Uh, it's a two unit CubeSat, uh, solar panels all, all over, you can see the command link antennas at the top, at, and at the bottom we have this hyperspectral camera which can uh, take photos. And the engineering model is basically to see that everything fits together and uh, in general doesn't break apart when you shake it and do other tests for it. Yeah, but it's supposed to be identical to the flight model which goes to space. So this is the one you shake up a bit and then the flight model is one you use silk gloves with. Yeah, just see that it basically works and do, do some other measurements also. Uh, <coughs> and here uh, you already saw the launch port, but here's another one where all the one is loaded into this quad pack uh, launcher. So there's uh, four tubes that all have satellites and that's used to tra uh, transport them to space and deploy. So how do you get to space? You can either get with these big rockets like SpaceX uh, or many others, and for example, this Falcon 9 can take 22 tons to sp uh, the orbit, but of course it's, you're not paying the, buying the rocket for yourself, so whoever pays most of it and takes the big satellites to space is basically paying most of it, and then you go when they are ready. But I said before that the launch opportunities are becoming faster, or, or more of those, so there are also these players making small rockets, for example, this, uh, these uh, vector space systems, and uh, this specific rocket is uh, supposed to take 60 kilograms to lower orbit to 250 kilometers. So not that far, but you could just launch this from, well, wherever you get the permit at. But they are planning to launch maybe 100 a year, so that's uh, quite a lot. SpaceX are really fast, but they are aiming, I think, maybe doing once or twice a month. So here's a short clip of deploying two CubeSats from the International Space Station. As you see, open the hatch, kick the satellites out, simple. Here's uh, the Indian uh, Space Agency deploying record-breaking 104 CubeSats uh, in one go. Out of those, 88 were of Planet, which is a company 
in Silicon Valley that they now have around 100 and maybe 40 satellites and they image the whole Earth every day. So you can, it's like Google Maps. You take one location, two days, see how it differs. And uh, yeah, just drop them there and they start going around the Earth and over time they will deorbit and burn to ash. So what would be a suitable mission? So if you want to make a satellite, it maybe w should do something other than beep because it, it should be something that we, we can extend in the future. So if we can achieve this and we get a, some good idea, someone wants to actually implement something, we have the basics there and not have to cover for everything else. So apps are a big thing. So the idea would be that make some kind of, well, Basically make an abstraction that you have any kind of app that can ask satellite for a picture. So there are quite many things to solve, but if you can solve those, uh, you're good to go. You can ask for anything from the satellite at that point. So uh, it's been done before, so it can't be impossible. But of course the challenge is that we, we haven't done it before and we don't really know all the steps in between. And that's why at first, for example, our Kanban board was maybe those four, four uh, uh, nodes. One node, make a satellite. Second one, make ground station, trigger camera, download file. Obviously, this doesn't really scale well if you have for this kind of project. So we have scrapped everything many times and just go forward with small steps and uh, see where it goes. And to achieve this, uh, we try to keep the design flexible, keep things simple, and always try to keep in mind what the minimum implementation would be. But of, of course, balancing these are really difficult because if you keep things simple, you might not be able to keep them flexible. So you kind of need to find a good compromise. If you make it too flexible, it's going to be too complex. No one's going to understand it. Uh, if it's too simple, you will end up to some, because we haven't done this before, we will end up to some dead end and have to scrap a lot of stuff to get on our tracks. And ways to achieve some flexibility, for example, find the right abstractions. As everyone probably knows, that's really hard. Using some existing protocols, providing existing tools and integrations. Having some kind of network topology that things can communicate with each other freely without committing to the organization too much beforehand. Like uh, microservices is maybe a good comparison. And if you think about scalability, we don't need a huge scale, but if you think about it beforehand, you might come up with good, good abstractions. And of course, it would be nice if all our offices would have their own ground stations. And uh, of course, we can delay something. So if we can, we can update or reconfigure the satellite afterwards, that's handy. We don't need to solve all those problems at this point. But that also poses new risks and requires some support to get that done. So compromises, compromises. So in a, like a <laughs> happy picture where there's the end, end user wi with his app, uh, they would like to see only some kind of one interface and uh, without knowing anything about this in between, get stuff from space. So how, what do we need to implement to provide this capability for the end user? If we, if we manage to do that, then we can do quite a lot of stuff already. So there are quite many interesting challenges. There are not many people in this. Uh, just like uh, maybe sev seven people working full time. Uh, distributed uh, design is always additional challenge. Managing many new technologies. Since we have background in software engineering, we have to learn about RF, mechanical engineering, electronics, also embedded development and uh, all the tools and whatnot required. And just for pure software development, of course, working with hardware is a new challenge because you actually need to freeze some designs at some point. 
because we don't have a workshop to manufacture all the uh, circuit boards and the aluminium frames and whatever. We need to order them. That might take some time and uh, it's not as fast and iterative as, as software only project. And the embedded ecosystem is not NPM install yet at least. And uh, even the big vendors selling chips, they sell those by millions. So their support for small projects and prototyping is not really where the open source software development community is at. Yeah, in general. Uh, yeah, so the question was that since we have a like software and di digital service background, do we have, how much background do we have in operations and such? And the answer is that in digital services and whatnot, we have experience, but everything coming with these projects, we don't have that much experience. So it's something we also uh, have learned and, and are learning by, by doing. Yeah, so, so we'll come to all, all, the, all that stuff too. And there's also another presentation, all, all the radio stuff and such, which I will refer to that you should check out if you're interested. But yeah, our background is software and the guys who in, in Otani, I mean, Reactor Space Lab, they have built the Aldo, uh, have been working with the Aldo satellite. So that's the only background. So we haven't operated satellite constellations before. <coughs> so, Coming to the physical side, uh, normal pro uh, computer projects, let's say, that are in a server hall or somewhere, uh, don't have these physical dimensions challenges. For example, uh, with a satellite, the satellite is in one place at what time, so, so you kind of have to schedule for things. You don't have that much bandwidth li limitations. Here you have maybe slow radio links. Uh, you only can reach the satellite when you can see it with your ground stations. You have power budget, you have thermal budget, how much you heat your satellite, and you have mass budget. The more grams you take to space, uh, the more it costs. And then there are external uh, factors that can make things challenging. Rockets can explode. You can't affect that too much. Uh, you have to allocate global radio uh, frequencies. That takes a lot of time uh, because it's coordinated globally. And you need some licenses. For example, we had to get radio amateur licenses to operate any radios. So what kind of software development we are doing? Uh, we're not covering too much about the hardware development. Maybe that's a, a separate uh, uh, speech, but uh, on software side, on the right hand side, we can see part of the stack of the uh, Hello World satellite. So we have different subsystems on different layers. They are interconnected and do different things. So to develop for this and the ground infrastructure, we're using basically all the operating systems. Uh, Windows we use because Atmel, which is the big chip maker that we also use chips from, has the Visual Studio based Atmel Studio and that's running on Windows. Uh, Runtimes, so in the satellite we are running Linux, a uh, couple of free artoses and a bunch of bare metal uh, uh, subsystems. Uh, for example, the power supply subsystem has only 64 KB of RAM and program memory and uh, runs at 8 megahertz. So you could fit free artos there, but uh, it's maybe better to keep it out, at least for our purposes. Sorry? What artos are you running? Uh, three artos. Uh, I think it's eight. Yeah. Version eight. Okay. Yeah. You, you run a couple. Yeah, so different subsystems uh, have uh, three artos. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, different yeah. microcontrollers that have different purpose are all operating their own operating systems. Or not. Since you mentioned the power budget. Yeah. So uh, how much operational time do we have with the power budget? Well, basically, as long as the su sun is shining, the, it's going to take long. But of course, we'll come to that a bit later. But of course, the we will deorbit before we run out of battery. But solar cells will give us the power. Uh, so we have a bunch of operating systems for development and targeting. But we also have many different uh, architectures. 
we have six different chips for running this stuff and in total we have nine uh, processors or microcontrollers in the satellite so that's quite a lot of uh, things to work with and that's only the satellite so there's the ground infrastructure too but that's more that's not embedded so we don't cover it in detail here in that um, in this data uh, so different programming languages and paradigms we use so there, there's really nothing too exotic here so most of the complexity comes from just having a lot of different parts the uh, if you divide it into many small pro problems like engineers like to do then none of the single pro pro problems are not that challenging uh, for the satellite or the ground infrastructure of course you need to know the basics but but anyone can learn those without extensive background in some science uh, our main languages are C, JavaScript and Python for C we basically well, Vesa's uh, presentation about the state was really perfect because we, we also have centralized state and allocate basically everything in advance and then take slices of that uh, for the bare metal implementations where we don't have uh, operating system we are using uh, finite state machines uh, which is kind of a good abstraction for dividing the work into small chunks and then interleaving those to get work done uh, and uh, most of the things work as interrupt driven so that we don't pull the devices but the devices always uh, inform the that okay there's something to do then we check out what's going on if if you're not familiar with embedded development this might be uh, like a out of your uh, knowledge or like understanding uh, well JavaScript uh, basic FRP stuff uh, UIs we use React uh, for Python we Python's uh, biggest source is the GNU radio which is the stack for operating the software defined radio hardware that we use and for just managing asynchronous stuff we use the async IO library we also tried Rust because Rust is really awesome but uh, uh, the LLVM backend for MSP430 wasn't maybe there quite yet and it's a bit challenging to work with the vendor tools and adding Rust into the play so we gave up with it at the moment at least but I, I want to see it fly Uh, so what kind of hardware do we work with uh, how, how do we start with so here's just uh, some off-the-shelf uh, stuff from uh, mainly Texas instruments so this is dev kit for the command link the green board is the uh, radio chip and then the red board is the microcontroller and then the green module on the right is a uh, uh, can module so all this cost maybe hundred bucks and you have a something that you can develop the software on already and once we have some software and maybe the electrical designs come a bit later uh, the guys at Space Lab can uh, design and develop then the actual board uh, that will go to the satellite or the engineering model which basically has most of the same parts and the integrations for the rest of the satellite and here you can also see that all the components are duplicated we'll come to the redundancy a bit later but uh, if there's a malfunction on some of the components we have a spare there and maybe the last part about just uh, in general about software development is continuous integration uh, so even for the embedded environment we want to immediately see if we break something so even from day one even if we didn't know if it really fits embedded development it, our knowledge that is that you need to have this running no matter what the project is so we set it up uh, basically we have then these dev kits or the engineering models that you saw are hooked into the CI machine and whenever we make changes we build this stuff compile it put it in we run integration tests so basically the app we defined at the beginning that would be our goal we run the app so all this stuff going from ground through the infrastructure to the radio 
to the command link, to the CAN bus in the satellite, to the whatever subsystem and back. We run all this stuff all the time. And that's one of the reasons we haven't really put too much time and effort into unit tests, because we don't know what we don't know, and unit tests are waste in general if you have to change the code, because then the unit tests are not valid and it's uh, yeah, waste. But we, we try to put them somewhere where we know that the implementation doesn't change. But it's more important to get the end-to-end -to, -end to work because that's what matters for us at the moment. And here's an example of the uh, CI setup. So this has some of the things running. So we have power, power management, uh, command link, and some boards that will flash the stuff. Uh, dev kit for the flight computer and on the top left we have the software defined radio so the infrastructure is just running on PC in, in, in docker containers and uh, the cable is the space with some attenuation seen there that's the space loss there <coughs> Yeah, so uh, if I got the question right, so how much effort was it to set up this whole end-to-end -end thing instead of maybe doing small things and then integrating them later? So <coughs> the good part about our decision of, of having this kind of a modular system uh, where all the devices are connected to one network, which will come soon, is that they are all working kind of like microservices. So we can test this individually and basically the only difference is that uh, is the message routed through radio or not and uh, since if the ground infrastructure side works well it shouldn't make be any bigger effort to inject the test in the data through the uh, CAN bus for example or through the radio stack so in that sense I don't think there was any additional effort required to do the end-to-end -end stuff because of our design. Yeah, there, there's no specific slide so I can answer. So what ca how do we uh, check the space environment? So those tests are then done to the whole engineering model. So those things are not done specifically for each component separately. So we integrate things, then we see about the uh, temperature management and uh, vibrations and whatnot. Radiation is something that uh, is uh, we know component, uh, for radiation tests you can uh, test the whole system but uh, booking time for that is challenging because there's, there's only one place in Finland where you can test it and it's also used for example European Space Agency so th there's, it's challenging to get time for those and uh, a lot of the chips we use are already tested individually so we kind of know that they are kind of tolerant and where we go the radiation is not as pain in the butt as in deep space. We'll see. We'll see if we get the radiation test done. But it, yeah. Yeah, question. Uh, no, so we are not in space yet. So the goal is to launch soon, maybe at the end of summer. We don't know specific dates yet. So we are, we are at the integration stage trying to get last things working. But this stuff is still today on our board, so we of course don't have many copies of the whole system. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice, but it's time off from someone else. So. But, uh, how many man hours to, to get the system? From this point of view, from here to production, uh, or to to get here? Yeah. From, from this to well. Well, we have worked on the project since the beginning of last year with different amounts of people and there's other stuff also than this. So, five man years, maybe. So not as much as you might think. Uh, yep. Uh, so yeah, architecture. We already had, had this picture, but just to recap, we have a satellite on the right hand side, it has a bunch of boards 
We have something magical in the middle that delegates the satellites when they pass by. And uh, we just have an end user who, doesn't, who shouldn't need to know about any, anything of this. So here's a bit more details <coughs> uh, about different parts of the system. So the satellite is now just one box in the sky. All this stuff is then running or providing services for the application here. This is just a person made the app or operates the system. And the lower part is basically deployed in the cloud and then ground stations you can have all over the world. And here's our, uh, as I said before, uh, this was already discussed on the last break, that we, we do everything by ourselves. So also the ground station. So this is from the uh, roof of the next building, Mannerheim in Tier 4, which is our development ground station. And why it's there is that you can see the balcony of this building here, so it's easy to climb on the roof and make the thing or fix it if it breaks, as we will see later in this presentation. <coughs> and here's what operating the thing looks like. So this is not what the app sees, but this is uh, what you use to operate it. So on the top left side, we have a video feed from the ground station, so we see what it's actually doing. Uh, in the middle, we have our mission control where we can pick satellites and set them up for communication. And on the right hand side, there's the GPredict open source program where you can just basically browse satellites and see uh, where they are uh, in our horizon. So on the bottom right corner. <coughs> so which steps uh, need to happen for, for the app to talk to the satellite? On the bottom right, we first create a mission, or basically we schedule our ground station. So we have a satellite in mind that our app wants to talk with. So we tell all ground stations that, okay, when it comes over you, point at it and uh, listen to it, and maybe if someone wants to say something to it, transmit it. This is delega delegated to all the ground stations, and they all have this kind of manager which operates all the things within the ground station. So the ground station is basically uh, radio hardware, the antennas, some software, and uh, ethernet cable, and, uh, and a power cable, and a rack of stuff. Uh, we'll s I'll show in a couple of slides so how, how many times we see the satellite. Yeah, so testing this is uh, kind of interesting. So if you are using, a si if you have a scientific or radio amateur satellite, you have to open the downlink. So we can listen, we can see that our downlink works. There are not many satellites that accept digital communications from ground up. So we haven't uh, done that yet uh, because there are not many options to try it with. But we can listen to many satellites, so that's handy. So we, we point at a passing satellite. Uh, when the satellite comes by, we configure the radio hardware for it. So we know what kind of, uh, we have Googled what kind of data it sends so we can decode it basically. We send it to our cloud uh, endpoint to which an application has subscribed to. And uh, when the backend gets uh, information that, okay, now this kind of satellite is by, the app is notified and the app can connect to the backend and then you have a, this red line is the data stream. And the app doesn't really need to know anything except listen for TCP uh, socket for, for stuff and that's coming from space and whatever you write to the TCP socket goes to space. So all the encoding and modulation and whatever is done uh, in between and the app only reads and writes data. So just a quick recap in, in a bit more detail. So actually all these uh, blue boxes are uh, a Docker, Docker containers. And when I showed the integration environment or the CI environment, all this stuff is running in the background. So the test cases 
launch a test app, connect to backend, create a mission, schedule a satellite, uh, transfer data through the radio link, notify app, talk back to the test satellite and back. And all the developers all also run the whole stack on their machines, because why not? And that's why you know what you actually need for the implementation instead of trying to do a lot of fancy stuff. But if you run and eat your own dog food, you really know where you can drop the useless stuff out. So the mission control is just a user interface you saw in the picture. Then we have inventory database for satellites that we have pre-configured uh, and with parameters that we pass for, for our rest of the system. Uh, then the ground station manager basically schedules locally what happens. It monitors what happens on the radio and the rotator and it commands them. The rotator basically uh, turns the antenna according to what the manager says and the radio basically routes the radio information back and forth and does some uh, modulation things that have been set up in the inventory before. And then the data comes down here. The radio backend basically provides a subscription API for the apps. So this satellite is now here. Please connect here if you want to talk to it. Uh, it archives data if we want and uh, does additional uh, encoding and decoding. And in our design actually, I, I wanted to put this because mistakes are al al always I interesting. So in our first design, we wanted to make the ground station as dumb as possible. So the front end wouldn't do much for the radio signal. So we route the whole radio signal to the back end. But this becomes a problem if you send raw sample data to internet. It becomes tens of megabits or hundreds of megabits really fast. So we can do it here at the office, but we will need to refactor this a bit if we want to deploy to cloud. But that's not really uh, uh, too, too much work, luckily. Uh, yes, because I don't have it on the on the slides. So our satellite has two radio links. The command link is running maybe at 9,600 bits per second, and the uh, data link maybe around one megabits per second. Yeah, it's it's basically another radio link, so you can transfer any data between yeah, the two. Yeah, yeah, the command link is the reliable one. It doesn't need to be fast because it's for maintenance purposes and needs to be reliable but not fast. Yeah, uh, and in summary, <coughs> so embedded development is quite a big thing, but networking is also quite uh, like a maybe even a bigger thing than the embedded development, or it's big anyway. So here are all the different uh, protocols and whatnot we are using. So for all the ground stuff, we are basically just using Node.js, JavaScript. So JSON REST APIs are handy. For all the real-time telemetry, locally we use WebSockets. To form the network for the satellite and the ground side, so basically the high-level transport and network protocol connecting the app to all these subsystems is this CubeSat space protocol and the name describes th its use case very well and it's, that's what it's made for. It's made in Arbok University in these similar CubeSat projects and it's been really handy. Uh, we'll see it in a bit more detail soon. Within the satellite we are using CAN bus which is usually used in automotive industry. For streaming the ARF data we are using 0MQ partly inherited from how GNU radio stack uh, provides interfaces with. And for application we use plain old TCP so you can make your application with whatever technology without having any additional stack. And uh, kind of networking but not that much is the different uh, interfaces we have to use within the satellite. So for device to device communication there are a lot of SPI used, uh, some serial communication, 
I2C and then camera link for fast uh, camera data transfer. And if you're interested about the radio stuff, like uh, how modulation works, what different kinds of antennas there are, what do the radio permits mean and what, what not, uh, you can check out the uh, my disobey uh, presentation for early this year, introduction to RF and satellites, and then Juho, Juho's uh, blog post at Reactor Blogs is also really good for explaining what's happening uh, on the radio side of things, so check that out also. Yeah, question. Yeah. I'm thinking what what things do I have in the upcoming slides? Yeah, well I don't think we have any anything regarding that, so I guess I can add it here. So how do we orientate the satellite? So the satellite uses this um, attitude control device, which is based on electri electronic magnets, or electromagnets. There are basically three coils that uh, you use to rotate the satellite against the Earth's magnetic field. So three axes, just switch those and you can rotate the satellite. Can you also have no, so we can't change orbit because we don't have propulsion, only yeah. orientation. Yeah, the, the direction. Um, yeah, uh, let's do, because this is my, yeah, let's leave uh, some of the questions. If it's, uh, if it's not on this slide, let's leave those to end just so that we can bundle those together. But if it's something on this slide, let's uh, uh, go through those uh, in real time. So please ask questions. Okay, so CSP, I want to show this because it's a really central to a lot of the design and I'm really happy to found it when we started this project. And it uh, serves a lot of our interests and uh, obviously peop we have used a lot of the designs that other people have used to support this. <coughs> so uh, this CSP part here is kind of like TCP or UDP and IP combined, so you have a destination and source address uh, and ports. Uh, so if you want ima to imagine uh, UDP da datagrams, this is what you can use. If you want uh, streams, you can use the RDP, which is reliable data protocol, which is, uh, or data transfer protocol, I don't remember. It goes within the CSP, so it provides TCP-like uh, streams and uh, acknowledgement and whatever. And if, so this way we can address all, we can assign addresses and ports to all the different parts of the network and they can talk to each other using this addressing. And this can be kind of arbitrary length, but over CAN bus you can only put eight bytes of data at once, so you need to fragment it. So the CSP stack also has this uh, fragmentation protocol which will fragment this into 8-byte pieces and then route it in the CAN bus. So the command link or the data link works basically as a gateway to transfer stuff to the CAN bus where it's routed using the fragmentation protocol uh, to the specific subsystems which run the CSP stack. So all the nice features bundled in one protocol, so that's really Nice. And then, of course, in networking, you always can put more protocols within protocols. So, of course, you get some overhead, but uh, you need to start from somewhere, and this is a really good start. <coughs> so, I've collected um, some uh, different, uh, well, not, not necessarily domain specific problems, but uh, just something that you might not bump into every day uh, coding in usual digital service projects. But there might be a lot of parallels to those too, so it's not really that unknown stuff. So tracking satellites, uh, we already discussed this a bit, but uh, <coughs> here's a screenshot of uh, basically all the active satellites in space, excluding maybe some military ones that are not openly uh, available. But there's around uh, 1300 active satellites here. 
all the red dots are active satellites, all the gray dots are some junk, and all the blue dots are some rocket bodies that are orbiting there and then have taken the red dots there. <coughs> and uh, this is from Stuff in Space, so if you want to browse this interactive website, it's quite nice. Uh, WebGL and stuff. So, depending on the orbit, so how close to the Earth you are, the faster the satellite goes. So where we are going is the lowest orbit, maybe around 600 kilometers, and the closer you are, the faster you go. So basically that means that if the satellite comes from the horizon in south, it passes by in maybe 10 to 12 minutes of one point on Earth. So if that's our ground station, that's the only duration we have to point at the satellite and talk to it per ground station. And uh, you also need to point at the satellite if you have, depending on your radio setup. And the satellites basically go seven and a half kilometers a second on that orbit, so explains, and it takes only 90 minutes to go around the whole Earth. And the polar orbit mentioned here means that if the satellite uh, Earth rotates like this, the satellite goes around the poles, so basically it sweeps the whole Earth. Like here you can see the red lines, it swipes the whole Earth, so we can actually see it from Finland, which is useful if we have the ground station here. <coughs> and another example, if you have a geostationary Earth orbit satellite, for example, um, uh, satellite TV or communication satellite, that's seemingly over one spot over Earth. So if you look on the rooftops, you see those dishes, they all point south to the equator because that's where all the satellites are. So they are in same location uh, relative to the Earth. But they are much further away. So if you would have satellite there, there's of course more delay and uh, yeah. So here we can see, depending on how far the satellites are from Earth, the footprint is bigger. So we can see them further away. That's why if you have the geosynchronous orbit in 35,000 kilometers, the footprint is basically third of the Earth. That's why anyone can point there and get the reception. If you have satellite really low, it will just go past quickly and you have only the small duration of time to talk to it. So if you have more ground stations, that's why we want to consider the scalability at the beginning. So if, we, if you have only Helsinki ground station, we have a few passes a day. But if you have New York and Tokyo and Amsterdam, whatnot, then we can triple the time easily. Okay, but how many, back to my original question, how many yep. passes a day over the horizon? Yeah, so how many passes a day in Helsinki? Uh, Maybe, maybe three or four. So you have basically, you can see here some, some passes. So the there are two different ground tracks. So this is actually for the International Space Station. You can see that it doesn't go above Helsinki. You can see it in the horizon, but not over sky. And this goes over the poles. So the, this shows three next passes, 90 minutes each. And of course, you see this long gap here. So when you're in between this long gap, that's the time you have to wait for the passes to start again. So those are the opportunities of contacting the weather with yeah. in the uh, Mannerheim in Finland. Yeah, so if we are here, whenever there's a pass by, we can talk to it. Of course, you could have a satellite to satellite links when you could have longer time to do that, but it hasn't really been implemented for uh, CubeSats at least yet. Maybe there's some scientific uh, projects for that, but not really commercial stuff, as far as I know. And here you can see also uh, what it looks like on the over the sky. So if we are in the middle, we can see that the satellite comes by. This is the sky track, and we can see that it only lasts maybe some 12 minutes to fly by. So where do we get this information? So there are big radars that track the objects in space and uh, you can freely get these TLEs that describe the location and velocity of the 
object uh, in space. And from that information you can extrapolate where the satellite is. And that basically gives you the, the direction and elevation for your antenna. So basically feed this to an open source library. Uh, you get out the direction. So you, you feed in the uh, TLE time and your location. You get where, where to point and then you give those commands to the uh, rotators. And uh, for example, this open source tool, gpredict, uses that same information. So, yeah. And who provides this information, you will ask. Uh, at least US Air Force, they have spent money for big radars, so they provide this information for safety of people on Earth. So here's a clip of our satellite doing a, it's a speed, a speed up version of a pass by so you can see that it comes from north and then it tracks over sky and returns to the original position for the next pass by. So it takes around 10 minutes to do that. Yep. Yeah. When you go out you will ask why is it not there? The <laughs> answer will come later. It's broken. <coughs> So reliability, it's maybe one of these things. <coughs> so there are many things to consider, but uh, maybe I picked some things that, uh, well, they are general, but also things that are maybe uh, more specific to this. So in general, just a software box. You might have just uh, some buffer overruns or underruns. Uh, you might get into some logical loops or deadlocks. There are ways to reduce this or detect this, but it's a, just a general problem. Then uh, if you change some configuration for your system, you might also break something. Like maybe many of you, if you have done operations, you have changed your SSH password over SSH. And then you're locked out when you make the mistake of, well, a mistake. So the same thing is here. If you have some parameters, let's say, to do what's the interval of booting some system and you put it to zero and then it goes to infinite loop of booting and you can't connect after that, it's game over. So uh, you want to design configuration so that you don't uh, shoot yourself in the foot that easily. Uh, in space, but also on ground, if you have a lot of infrastructure laid out, for example, uh, mobile stations for phones, uh, radiation effects can be a bit challenged. So there are these single event is basically a definition for something that's usually caused by uh, radiation that just happens, like the stars are aligned and then bit flips. And if you're lucky, the bit flips and when you write it or wait or whatever, it will reset. But if you're unlucky, it will get permanently stuck. Uh, if it's memory, you might detect that and maybe blacklisted. But if it's, for example, your register in your uh, CPU and uh, there's memory address or program counter gets one bit stuck, it's game over basically. So there are ways to work with this, but uh, basically you need to have some spare hardware to work, um, get out of that situation. Uh, Kind of sa same uh, reasons or maybe some other electrical malfunctions. If you read some sensor data, for example, temperature or the, uh, the brightness of the sun or whatever, if something breaks, you might get like spikes in your data or you might get something stuck to high level or low level. So if you get a spike and you make a decision to reset the whole system because of uh, getting a one wrong reading, it might be deadly also. So you may need to do some filtering for that kind of stuff. And then just over time, solar panels and uh, batteries will degrade. So your calibration data may not be the same one year after launching than what you did on the workbench. Yeah, so because of these reasons, your mission might end in the launch or after a year or sometimes much later. 
So uh, th uh, ways to improve the reliability. So watchdog is, uh, many of you probably know, so it's a basically a counter. And if you don't reset it, it will boot your system. Uh, really cheap way to kind of improve reliability is fail fast. So just put in a lot of assertions. If a pointer is null, if some value is out of scope, just uh, freeze the system, wait for the watchdog to byte and uh, the whole system resets and hopefully things get recovered. You can monitor things over the network. So if it locally seems to work, if, you, if some supervisor thing doesn't get contact from your other subsystem, that supervisor system can turn off the power and turn it back on. Uh, <coughs> some microcontrollers might have some memory protection. For example, the uh, some MSP chips, they have shared memory for, for the RAM and your program code. So if there's a problem, you might override your code, so resetting won't fix it. So you may need to uh, protect some parts of your memory from any kind of writes, at, at least accidental writes. You can just buy more resilient hardware, but uh, that's of course might be really expensive, and that's the more traditional way of doing things. And uh, yeah, it's all, all a balancing act, kind of like we don't have a lot of unit tests, we try to do integration tests, but we also use cheap hardware because expensive hardware is too expensive. Uh, example of redundancy, so this can be in many different contexts. Uh, so for hardware, you can just have redundant hardware, like uh, in the picture we had a two sets of identical components for the radio link. You can have memory that can fix uh, bit flips, for example, single bit flips automatically. So the code or application doesn't really have to do anything. If you transmit data, you can have forward error correction. So you add some additional data. And even if some errors are introduced into your signal, the receiver might be able to fix those. So you don't need to retransmit. Uh, well, I the good thing about cheap satellites is that just make two satellites. If the other one or half of them break, you still have operational system. Just ship more. And uh, okay, talk about uh, space junk is completely another discussion, which is also a problem that's not completely solved, but uh, hopefully science will do that. And also, one cool thing, but uh, maybe a bit more extreme, is just redundant execution. So do the same thing many times and combine the results and take the most common result. Or if you have just two processing units, if there's a different difference in the output, uh, reset the whole system and try again. Uh, okay, uh, a general stuff about feedback and also why our ground station broke. Actually, we don't know, but if we had proper feedback management, we probably wouldn't be there. So yeah, probably anyone, everyone knows like closed loop. So you put some input, you get output. But instead of just doing that, you feed, uh, monitor what the output is and do adjustment to the input so that you reach the desired output levels. So this can be applied to many different things. For example, for regulation's sake, we have to monitor our RF output power. So we sample how much we transmit, and if anything goes wrong, we can just kill the uh, transmission. The antenna rotator, which we will see on the next slide, uh, basically controls these uh, DC motors, and it has feedback sensors telling where is it pointing now. So if you know that you need to point that way and you are now pointing that way, you start turning it until you reach your destination. For the attitude control that we kind of touched uh, before, so how to turn the satellite, so there are different sensors, for example, detecting where the sun is or uh, in some more expensive systems, you detect where the stars are and from those patterns you know uh, how you're orientated. So that information is fed back to the control algorithm in the system, which then adds torque to the system and it sees how it affects and then it adjusts the torque 
to just reach the desired uh, pointing direction. And uh, if you're deploying something, so deploying in a satellite means that you open your solar panels or your antennas and whatever. You also want to know if those are deployed. So if you get feedback that uh, sensor information, for example, through telemetry that something failed, you can manually try again. And uh, interesting design flaw we had for deployment detection was that the antennas you saw in the earlier picture, they are folded down and have springs. And there's a sensor, a switch, uh, detecting if it's opened. But, and it's tied with uh, this uh, uh, plastic cord and, uh, when, and you melt it to deploy the antenna. And then you see that it's detached from the switch and you know it's deployed. <coughs> but what happened? The spring is deactivated. Yeah, so the spring uh, applies the uh, strength and then it's just held back by the string. Uh, so spring and string. So what happened was that we tried to deploy or burn the string, but it actually had many, uh, consists of many strings. So it partly melted and it uh, uh, lifted off from the switch so it basically, um, the heating of the uh, string just stretched it. So it detached from the, uh, from the switch. So we thought it's deployed, but it actually was still held down. It was just detached from the switch. So mechanical, no matter how good your uh, software is for retrying and whatever, if the mechanical setup is wrong, uh, you don't know if it's actually deployed. So we need to address that. <laughs> So it was, yeah, wrong kind of uh, fishing rod line used for the <laughs> attaching it. And here's the ground station, so why it's not there. So this cable shouldn't be wrapped around this mast like this. <coughs> so we have a backlog of things how to improve this, but uh, the control system and the rotator, it's an uh, existing product that we bought. And as we said that we kind of need to take some, make compromises on how much reliability we want. So we kind of expected it to work properly, but we, so we scheduled a flyby for a satellite. We went for lunch. It had worked perfectly for one year. And when we came back, we, we saw this. And what we think that what happened was that, uh, it, so it has, sensors that feed back the information where it's pointing. It started turning, but the, the azimuth sensor didn't give any feedback back. So it kept turning and turning and turning and turning. And because it didn't get the information that it, it's actually moving, it just kept turning until the power cable cut when it had went around five times around uh, the, its neck. Of course, the <coughs> worst case was as you can maybe guess, is that the power cable was the longest cable. So all the other cables broke, so we need to replace those also, and not just the power cable. So we relied on an existing product that it would do this kind of management, that it's not reacting to the commands properly, so it should just kill the power and wait for the user to intervene. And we also didn't think about this uh, before, we actually thought about this beforehand, but we, we didn't put additional layer of supervision because we kind of thought that it would work in these cases. And uh, yeah, then we want to now add also mechanical things to just make sure that the power cable is snapped off if the software, uh, power cable is snapped off first if the software fails somehow. But yeah, lessons learned. Yeah, yeah, so the uh, installation and uh, stuff is by, uh, made by ourselves. And the, so the uh, antennas and the rotators and stuff, those are basically like amateur radio stuff anyone can order uh, and then set up. But it works the same, it's just physics. And the last one, uh, not for any particular reason, but just in general power management. We, everyone knows that the, in the cold, the, the smartphones get kind of challenging. So here's also, it's also same in space. 
So we need to see the sun with solar panels to charge the batteries. So there, there are a couple of challenges. So we only need to be on the sunny side of Earth, so which is maybe 60% of the time. Maybe 40% of the time you're on the shadow, so you can't charge. When you're in shadow, it gets cold. But you shouldn't charge batteries on the sunny side when your batteries are too cold, because that generates, uh, degenerates the batteries. Like you shouldn't charge your iPhone after coming from the Finnish summer day, freezing, snowy, yeah. So it's a kind of chicken and egg thing that you need to heat batteries and waste power so that you can actually charge the batteries. Uh, you can also conserve power, so if you have done some really uh, power consuming thing, you can just turn down the uh, um, not so important parts of the satellite, or you can reduce some uh, duration when you send telemetry or do some other things. And uh, which was touching the reliability side, uh, there are also challenging things that uh, if you're reading battery levels or whatever, you get some kind of uh, intermittent problem. You may not want to immediately react to it. So may, you may want to average things out or uh, discard some readings that seem completely out of place. Also, if we get, for example, those hard uh, latch up problems so that the uh, microcontroller, for example, is completely wasted, it's still set up so that it's quite likely that the analog electronics will still supply power for the critical telemetry system. So if, if the brains get toasted, we might still get the information that the brain is toasted because we default to giving power to the, the crucial parts, even if the like, uh, computer is down. And uh, also the, the capacity of the batteries and the, the solar cells will degrade over time. So whatever you calibrated beforehand, that might not work for five years in the future if you're still in space. Uh, but still something, so these are all like kind of problems, but you can all handle all of these in a graceful manner. So it's one way of managing the problems, just keeping in mind that you don't always need to make a hard, hard landing to try to recover, but you may need to actually try to slowly downgrade the service just to keep the dream alive, so to speak. <coughs> That's it. Uh, if you want to learn more about the space stuff, and especially uh, the RF stuff, check out the blog post by Juho or this uh, YouTube video from the Disobey conference, which is uh, in general about satellites and, um, and RF. And you can follow the whole Reactor Space project in Twitter with uh, Reactor Space hashtags. And as Tuomas already showed, we are always hiring. So check out our careers also. Thank you.